Hello there, visitors to the Pipecat channel. This is your buddy Larry here, as always. I uh, I was inspired to make this video today because uh, I was thinking about the videos that I've made um, recently, and a lot of them have been kind of melancholy, you know, and the loss of my cat, things like that. And sometimes I forget that there are things that make me happy, too, that probably, you know, don't get enough mention. And um, I was inspired this afternoon by something I watched uh, on YouTube. If uh, it's the uh, the end of my uh, my my man of war uh, ruination cigar, but um, if you are a guitarist, uh, a lot of guitar players visit my channel. You are probably very familiar with a guy by the name of Rick Beato. And um, he does sometimes some, some really uh, wonderful, uh, you know, uh, criticisms, critiques, let's call it, reviews maybe of, uh, of songs. And he has artists on there that are, that are interesting. And today he did a, a live uh, podcast about a particular song, what he was calling a perfectly written song. And um, what was inspiring about it to me is that this has always been one of my favorite songs. Since, well, always, you know, since it was first released. I think it was 1983. And uh, I thought it was worth talking about just because of the way it makes me feel. Um, before I get into it, let me give you a little quick update. My, uh, my recent video about the loss of my cat, Benny, it's funny how the universe works. Um, I said then, and I will say now, that nothing's ever going to, you know, take the sadness out of my heart and soul over the loss of my friend Benny. Nothing, nothing could. And I was consigning myself to live alone, you know. Uh, no more pets, I said. I said, I'm not going to say goodbye to another animal. I, you know, I just wasn't in a good place. And uh, and I thought, no, you know, people tell me, well, give it some time, you know. Uh, give it some time. You know, the, the universe is funny, you know. God or whoever works funny. And sometimes, uh, you know, solutions or, or at least tools for healing, you know, come out of nowhere. As it turned out, Within just a couple of weeks of the loss of Benny, uh, my family uh, came to me with a request because my nephew, um, who has kids of his own or whatever, well, they just moved out of an apartment and they had three cats, three very nice cats. And um, they didn't know where to put them. They couldn't take them with them. Um, and I couldn't see them going to a shelter. So, of course, you know, the way things work. Well, gee, you know, Uncle Larry, uh, you know, has all that cat stuff. And, um, and no cat. Maybe he could, you know, consider taking them for a while till we get settled. Well... I'll just show you. Up there, well, that is uh, one of three. That's Malcolm. Malcolm has a uh, a big brother, well, a litter mate, but larger than him, named Marshall, who is uh, over, over there at the water fountain. And they have an adopted little black and white tuxedo sister, tiny little thing, uh, and her name is Jolene, and she usually hides. She's very affectionate, but she's shy. So, I started out when I moved into this apartment in 2009 with three cats. I had uh, Sweepy, I had June, and I had Benny. Sweepy was the mother of the other two. 
and uh, you know, and, and over the last just the last couple of years, actually beginning in uh, November of 2020, I began to lose them. June passed away of cancer, and then just a few months later, a half a year later, Sweepy died of uh, organ failure, and then Benny died of kidney failure. Recently, well, I got used to having three cats in all that time. And uh, fate has served me three cats again. I think the likelihood of my nephew actually ever taking these cats back is slim to none, you know. Um, they're probably going to end up being my cats. And uh, I'm going to come back to the Rick Beato thing. I just wanted to give you a quick update on this. I think uh, my heart was so broken over Benny that I, I really... I mean, I could say that I was despondent. You know, I don't have a wife or any children of my own. And so it's not like I lost a wife or child, but this is the closest I was ever going to come. Benny was my my little, my familiar, my little soulmate. Just my, my partner in all things, you know. He was like just like my right arm. There was just nothing that I did that Benny wasn't a part of. My ruination went out. But... I was having a very hard time getting over his loss. And I thought, nothing is going to get me through this. Nothing but time. But it's funny how things work out, because then these cats came and joined me, and um, time was taken out of the equation. And I'm not saying that having them has replaced Benny, or, or even Sweepy or June. But, you know, having them... Uh, Having them, ha you know, have to come and live with me gave me a purpose that uh, whether I wanted it to or not did actually interrupt my sorrow. I'll put it that way. Um, these guys are great. You know, they're, they're wonderful cats. They're very friendly. They're friendlier than my three were. They really are. They're also a little wilder than my three. I think the two big orange males are about six years old, if I'm not mistaken, and I think the little female is about five years old. <clears throat> and, um, you know, uh, having them here has caused me to have to put my, my grief, my, my mourning, let's call it, on hold maybe uh, until who knows when. You know, I mean... I have mixed emotions about it. On one hand, I feel as if my processing time for the loss of Benny and the prospect of living alone here was sort of... Um, one side of me feels like I've been cheated out of it. Another side of me feels like I've been rescued from it for a while. But anyway... Um, Somehow it's gotten me back on a more even keel having them here. So I guess, you know, overall I'm grateful, you know. And uh, I'm realizing that time isn't just going to be for the processing of the loss of Benny. And still the other two, you know, the first two that I never really got over. But not only is it going to help me process their loss, but time is also going to afford me an opportunity to learn to love, you know, three new cats. And they'll probably outlive me, but... So that's kind of... I don't know. It, it's, it's contributed to sort of a catharsis for me. An emotional catharsis, maybe. A, a re-examination of self. You know, um asking myself questions like, do I really want to hold on to grief that strongly? Or can I not have to grieve so hard and still feel as if I'm living life? And it's not like I'm cheating Benny or Sweepy or June out of their memories. I'm not. Nothing I ever do could ever cheat them out of that. They, they, they lived it. They earned it. They, you know, everything about them that I love so very much, you know, will always be part of you know, my, my, my memories of them, it's part of me. But um, maybe I can find it in myself to, uh, you know, 
to learn again. So, that all said, putting the subject down now about cats, but it, it kind of got me in a place where I, I kind of feel like I want to make videos again. Um, I kind of feel like I want to to just live more, not dwell on things. I mentioned in a previous video, and I've never forgotten this comment, I was accused by someone of being pathologically nostalgic. Never forgot those words. And um, the person who said that is really no longer a part of my life. Um, he was my, uh, my sister's live-in boyfriend for many years. Smart guy. And, uh, well, they've parted ways, and he is now uh, married, and I think he's expecting his first child. But I don't really know him anymore. He's just kind of moved on. Um, he was not a sentimental kind of guy and did not maintain ties with the family. Plus, you know, we never, you know, we were never great buddies, but, you know. But he said that about me once, and I said, wow. When he first said it, I was like, you bastard. You know, what a terrible thing to say to someone. He said it about me and my sister, his girlfriend, my sister Lisa. You know, these guys are pathologically nostalgic. They can't get past the past. Well, we're a lot, and I mean a lot, older than him. He's a young man. And, um... Another very good friend of mine, um, whom this gentleman never met, probably didn't even know existed, female friend of mine, and she'll know when she watches this that I'm talking about her. I'm looking at you, Joan. She said to me, you know, maybe that comment's not such a bad thing. She got me thinking about it. She's like, you know, being pathologically nostalgic, all right, maybe there's a little hard in the word, but the fact is, you're nostalgic. You, 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 you know, she's basically making me feel like I, I cherish the things that have become part of me. I don't like to let them go. I've talked about my dad, you know, my, my, my upbringing, you know, my past, my history. Sure, there's a million things about my life that I've never mentioned on my video channel here. But, um, you know, I do hold on to them. And at my age now, you know, approaching 60, I don't, you know, I don't have the aspirations that I had as a kid. Oh, someday I'm going to this or that. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, have a great big boat and I'm going to retire early and I'm going to live on an island or I'm going to live in the mountains or I'm going to live, you know, by the sea somewhere. I'm going to have five kids and, you know, they're all going to be doctors and, you know, maybe not. Maybe that's maybe that's not going to happen. So being pathologically nostalgic, I'm going to kind of turn that into sort of just being uh, appreciatively nostalgic. I don't know. What do you want to call it? So part of the nostalgia brings me to my Rick Beato comment that I opened this video with. Um, it's a quiet, it's a quiet Saturday here in New England. And it's, you know, it's a little, the weather outside reminds me of myself. Days like this always do. A little gray, not sunny. Pleasant. The air is fresh with springtime out there, and, but it's cool. It's cool and it's overcast and it's not quite raining. The air has a certain chill in it, but it's overall good. And, um... Always reminds me of myself days like this. It, just, it expresses me. The, the sky is expressing me today. So, in a mood like that, I started watching videos this morning. I just wanted to occupy my mind with things. And I started out looking for, uh, you know, guitar videos. Because I'm very interested in guitar builds and people's reviews of instruments and the way people play. Just learning. I'm always trying to learn something new. And Rick Beato had a live stream going on. And um, I'm subscribed to him. And I said, well, gee, you know, uh, I haven't watched him in a while. Maybe I will. And doesn't it figure he wanted to talk about one song that he calls Perfectly Written by the musical group called Eurythmics. I'm sure you know who they are. And... Um, he wanted to talk about the one song that I always loved from them. 
probably, arguably, fighting for the number one spot with me is my favorite song of all time. Um, I used to be a rocker when I was a kid, but, you know, as I got older, I realized that I, I appreciated, you know, moody pop music. Not a whole lot of electronic sounds, just moody pop music written with nice melodies uh, and good vocals. And when Eurythmics came out, I said, that's an interesting band. And he wanted to talk about the song called Here Comes the Rain Again. It's a beautiful song written in an A minor with a lot of expressive chording in it. And really, uh, things that, that really strike me. Uh, writing, writing tools that really strike my, my mood and my persona, I think. It's, a, it's written in a minor key, it's moody, and it, 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 move, it moves like the tides on the ocean, if you know what I'm saying. It's, it's uh, the song, if you know the song, it is, uh, it, it's beautiful. She sings it beautifully. She sings it with power, with soul. She sings it with, you know, attitude, yet she doesn't overdo it. She's like, you know, here comes the rain again. It's falling on my head like a like a memory. You know, raining on me like a new emotion. And as I said, rainy, overcast days, they, they remind me of myself. When I heard that song, it, it struck a chord with me and, and resonated with me. And it made me feel almost like it was written for me, about me. When I first heard it, I was like, that's a, that's perfectly, that's it. Here Comes the Rain Again is not a bad thing. Here comes more of, here comes more of the, the moodiness, the sensuality, the, 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 the introspection, you know, here it comes again. And, um. One particular memory I'll share with you. It was probably probably late fall of '83, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, I was in uh, I was still in school then. I was in I was in college. I was in Hartford, Connecticut. I had two roommates. Um, they were both musicians. One of them was a virtuoso classical pianist. His name was Bobby. And uh, the other guy's name was Pete, and Pete was a uh, a saxophone player, a jazz sax player, and a guitarist. And these guys were just rippling with talent. They couldn't be, they I mean, they couldn't be more different from each other. Bobby was, uh, well, you know, looking back, Bobby was a newly discovered homosexual man I'm not homosexual neither was Pete but we both knew Bobby was but I don't think Bobby at the time was fully embracing it you could see it in him he didn't talk about guys and dating guys or anything like that but there was something about him and it was great to, to, to know it Pete and I watched him with interest and um, and we used to just say to each other in private, you know, one of these times, one of these days he's going to come out. He hasn't even come out to himself yet. you got to figure the guy was probably 19 years old at the time. Handsome, handsome dude, too. I know I'm going to sound like I'm gay, but I'm not. Bob was uh, athletically built. He was an Olympic diver, actually. But he was also a classical piano player. And man, could that guy play. Holy shit. I, I would go listen to him practice his thesis piece that he was working on. It was a piece by Ravel called Gaspar de la Nuit, Terror of the Night. It's a long, um, uh, impressionistic, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's a kind of classic writing. But he was supposed to play that piece all the way through to its end. It's one of the most intense musical things. If you can get on YouTube and see if you can find Gaspar de la Nuit being performed by a pianist. Tense, chaotic, you know, kind of scary in places. 
very, very hard to play. And I would watch him practice that on the grand piano down in the student union. Um, and I'd just, I'd just sit on a couch nearby and just listen to him, and I'd be like, what the? And I, just, I was mesmerized. So Bobby was great that way. Pete, now, Pete was breezy and cool, man. Well, all three of us were from Massachusetts. They put us all together in one place. You know why? Because it was a Jewish school, and we weren't Jewish. So, Pete was Irish. Bobby, probably, I'm thinking English. Um, and me being Italian and Portuguese. They kind of lumped us all in one suite. We had a couple of other uh, dorm rooms. There was a suite of four dorms that met in one common area. And um, none of these guys were Jewish. We had a couple of Italian kids from uh, New York City. Boy, they were a trip. Uh, okay, I had a couple of basketball players over here. Just a hodgepodge of non-Jewish guys that they just put in one place. You know, the, the riffraff, if you will. The people who weren't going to come out of school and go straight to the jewelry district in New York City. No, we were all destined for other things. But um, in, that, in, in that atmosphere, um, Bobby being brilliant, Pete being cool, me being whatever I am, uh, we, we shared this tiny space, and I slept in a bottom bunk, and Bobby slept above me, and Pete slept on a single bunk on the other side of the room. Well, there was a weekend that uh, those two decided to go home for a weekend, and I was left there. I didn't, uh, I didn't get a ride home that weekend, so it was a late, late night, and there was this little radio. It was about that big. And it was shaped like a, a classic car. I think it was a Rolls Royce. The speaker was underneath it. And the knobs were in the back. And it was a little tiny AM radio that one of those guys brought with them and put on our desk. There was only one desk in the room. This little shiny gold plastic radio. Co you know, go gold-coated, you know, plastic little AM radio. And the funny thing was um, Pete was a uh, one of the DJs at the college radio station. He did a sort of like a a, a new wave show. And um, um, he was... Uh, he got me interested in the music of the day. I wasn't really into the music of the early 80s myself. I was still stuck in the 70s. He's like, Larry, you know, this way you're talking, it was really, you know... One of these, one of these guys. Oh, Larry, you gotta open your mind. I mean, hey, don't block out what's out there, man. The new stuff coming out, some of it's pretty good. Give it a shot. Give it a shot. Well, the college radio station was an AM station. He said to me, "Hell, oh, these guys are cool, man. Just you know, leave the radio on. And just listen. Just listen. You don't have to have it on the big stereo. Just, just listen." So this night, I was having trouble sleeping. I was alone in the dorm room, and. Um, and that little radio was on the desk, and I had it playing at, at a volume barely above a whisper to help me sleep. And I heard somebody say, this is a new one from uh, Eurythmics, and uh, I think you'll like it. It's called Here Comes the Rain Again. So I started listening. The first couple of chords that I heard, like pizzicato string notes. And I was listening, and I'm like, hmm. And then she started singing. And I was like, oh, wow. Wow, listen to her. And the melody just grabbed me. This little squeaky radio, I actually sat up in, in the bed. And I said to the darkness of the room, I'm like, wow, I really like that. And it was strange. I just sat there and I listened to the whole song until it got over and I liked it so much that I went over and shut the radio off when the song was over. I didn't want to hear the next song. I was humming that in my head. I'm like, i got to buy that or something. I love that song. And so ever since then, and we're talking about, you know, 1983, until now, it still has remained pretty much among my favorite songs. So today, I'm watching Rick Beato. I want to talk to you guys about a perfectly written song. 
and it was that one. I was like, yeah, yeah, let me hear his, let me hear, hear his deconstruction of this song. And of course, you know, he's holding his guitar and, and he's playing a piece right there and then he's mimicking it on the guitar. The guy can play anything. And uh, he's talking about it. And he's talking about the music theory of the writing and the performing of the song and every little bit about it. This note and how it has tension and that chord and how it creates an anticipation. And I was like, yeah, man. And he was just like, singing my soul out on that song. I was, I've never heard anybody really talk about that song. I thought I was the only one who loved it so much. But apparently I'm not. And it made me feel good to think that someone, a musician of the caliber of Rick Beato, loves that song as much as I do. So much so that he did a live stream on it. The perfectly written song. I thought, wow, that's pretty damn cool, man. In fact, it was so cool, it was inspiring. I said, you know what? I'm going to make a video about that because, you know, it was one of the things that that song, you know, was one of the things that kind of created the personality that I was eventually going to have because I was only, what, 18, going on 19 when I first heard that song. And, um, boy, it would hum in my head all the time. Whenever I heard it on the radio, I would just stop whatever I was doing. You know, I never actually ended up buying that song. Never did. I didn't want to get sick of it. That's why my sister Lisa won't uh, won't buy Beatles albums. She doesn't ever want to get sick of them. When she hears them randomly, she loves it. She knows them all, but um, she won't she won't buy them. And um, I kind of got that. So that was uh, that was a cool moment today, and just. The fact that Rick Beato is talking about my song in such a cool way, and such a way as only a guy like him can talk about a song. And I was reading the comments, because it was a live stream, I was reading the comments going by, and when you weed out all the, you know, the dum-dums, you know, oh, somebody over there. That's got to be Malcolm. He's the, he's the vocal one. Yep, looks like he came down off the tree. He's the one who meows after he goes to the litter box. But um, it put me in, in a mood, and that coupled with the weather out there, and it got me thinking about Benny and the cats and my family and, you know, my, my station in the world. It got me thinking about the things that are important to me. And I'm almost proud to say that a beautiful song is that important to me and who I am and uh, how I feel and you know the way I the way I see the world so I thought it was a really cool thing and I just wanted to make this video to share the moment with you it's, it's uh, kind of a perfect storm emotionally for me today to for the first time maybe rise up out of the the horror that was the loss of my cat recently feel like me again, at least for a day. I'll be sad again, sure, you know? But, I mean, I can uh, I can remember who I am without Benny, I guess. Who I was long before Benny. Just for now. And um, it's helpful. So I guess what I want to say is, if you've lost someone, pet, person... See if you can remember who you were before you knew them. You know, you know, if they weren't one of your parents or whatever, but you know, someone someone you knew maybe or someone you haven't seen in a long time and, and who you're missing. Try to remember what you were about without them, before them. And kind of look at it as you being you that might have attracted them to you and made them part of your life. Remember who that person was, you know, uh, that, you know, got them to be part of your life. And what attracted you to them, you know, uh, made you gravitate towards them. And uh, think of the things that you've got and that you've contributed and that, and that you appreciate. I think that's the big thing. For me, the things I appreciate. Being pathologically nostalgic you know it um 
it can be helpful. I won't call it pathologically, but I will say, you know, systemically nostalgic, maybe. Um, it's kind of cool to remember who you were and how much of it is still who you are. And then you can actually have a, you know, sort of a measure by which you can gauge how much you've accumulated since those early days. Who are you now? And are you still going to be you and more tomorrow? What will you collect and assimilate and make part of your life tomorrow? Mm. Never let anyone tell you that lighting a cigar is easy. Never let anyone tell you that having a shooting flame this close to this much dry hair is not nerve-wracking. So far I've been lucky. I've never smoked my own hair. Yeah, man. Man of War. Man of War cigars. I, uh, I strongly advocate those. I love Man of War. My favorite, actually, is uh, Damnation, but uh, they were really expensive, and I haven't been able to afford them in a while. This is uh, Ruination, and I got it as part of a sort of a package deal, a sampler deal, from, um, did I go on cigars.com? I think that's where I went. But yeah, that's, uh, these are something that, weren't part of my life in 1983. In fact, um, I was smoking cigarettes, a lot of them in those days. Uh, I'm glad that part of my life is over. This is very different. You know, it says on the package of cigars that cigars are not a safe alternative to cigarettes. Sure they're not. Lighting up a bunch of weeds and stuffing them in your face isn't going to be a safe alternative to anything, ever. But... I consider it controlled damage. I know what it does to me. I know what it does. I know probably how many years it's taken off my life, roughly, you know. But the fact is, though, it's calming. It makes me focus. I enjoy it very much. <clears throat> One thing I should probably say, and I used to say in the early days of my channel when I was doing pipe tobacco reviews, <clears throat> something like this, I treat it like a habit, probably. And I used to always say, don't make it a habit. But it's also not a hobby. I see the people on the tobacco sales channels, the tobacco company channels. <coughs> oh, yeah, you can enjoy the pipe smoking hobby. It's not a hobby. It's a vice. It's always going to be a vice. It's dangerous. It's like alcohol, you know. You have a hobby drinking alcohol. Some people make it into a crutch. I've seen some people where it's almost a career. But um, this, to me, is uh, my controlled damage. And uh, yeah, it makes me uh, it makes me feel okay to be by myself. Because a lot of people don't appreciate you smoking one of these in front of them. You guys do. But, um, yeah. Man of War Ruination. Pretty good. If you've never heard Eurythmics do Here Comes the Rain Again, I'm sure most of you have, but if you have never heard it, go listen to it and just listen to the whole thing. Appreciate every note. And if you're a guitar player, try and do what's, what's the guy's name? I forget his name. Annie Lennox's partner there. Listen to what he does on the guitar. I think he's using a strat and really cool altered minor chords and things like that. And little little musical stabs here and there throughout the song. And then the use of a string section, which they were very big on. Probably electronic strings, but who knows. But that's a great song. And uh, it, it, it really, it, it it's a summary of my mood most of the time, that song. And I love it. So that said, I'm going to leave this video right there. Thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for visiting my channel again. I'll say it again. I don't monetize my channel. I make no money from YouTube whatsoever. I never intended to. But um, I like sharing content. 
I'll probably do more guitar stuff, you know, uh, pretty soon. But for today, I just want to share that moment with you and uh, and uh, appreciate your presence here. If you sub my channel or like the video, it's only because I like to see who's watching. I like to know that it's appreciated. And for all the subs that I do have, which is not a huge number, but still pretty good. I never expected to have so many. Um, thank you for that. And I will talk to you guys soon. Keep enjoying the springtime. It's been beautiful in New England so far. And uh, summer's right around the corner. So, uh, you know, enjoy the weather. Try to save the world from your little corner. And when you vote, vote the topics. Vote the message. Don't vote party. Okay? I'm just going to leave it like that. You know, left, right, center, whichever way you go. Vote the topics. Look at the world. Look at the way it is here in America. And vote the way you want it to be. Okay? Don't don't look at the status quo. Because for all the promises they've made of where we're going with this, did we ever get there? Were we there for a while? How were we? How did we get there the last time? Do that again. That's all I'm going to say. So you guys have a great day. Thanks for visiting my channel. Take care of yourselves.